So uh, spending a few days leading up to Easter talking about the resurrection. Um, if you missed part one, jump back into the video and uh, you can find that one on our on our channel. And so last time we just, you know, I'll do a quick, really quick uh, review here. What is the resurrection? Something we talked on last time, touched on last time. Hey, touch. Woo. Um, what is the resurrection? Well, here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that as human beings, we are two parts, body, soul. Death separates the two for a time, but not for all time. That's the hope of the Christian uh, message. And uh, resurrection is the eventual reuniting of the body and the soul uh, for all time. All right. So N.T. Wright, he talks about this as the resurrection is death's reversal. So what, what death does, resurrection fixes. So the hope of the Christian then is not that we would uh, be immaterial spirits for all time, although that will be for a time until the second coming of Christ. But the hope of the Christian is that we would, um, that our bodies would be raised from the grave and that we'd be reunited with our souls, glorified, immortal, and um, we would get to enjoy the resurrected cosmos, resurrected creation for all of eternity in God's kingdom. So that's resurrection. Why is it important? Um, first of all, what we saw, it's the keystone to Christianity that if there is no resurrection, then what Jesus did on the cross means nothing. Good Friday, zip, zero, zilch, if there's no resurrection Sunday, all right? So um, Paul goes on to say that, man, we're to be pitied more than all men if Jesus has not, in fact, been resurrected, if the dead are not resurrected. So it's the keystone to Christianity. And then number two, it's essential to the gospel. And, and I would add to that for this time that um, it's essential to the gospel and it's also how the church is called to remember the gospel. All right, so if you look at the ordinances of baptism and communion, uh, these two in particular, uh, take a look at baptism. If baptism is only a picture of Jesus' death, then uh, we wouldn't call it baptism. We'd simply call it drowning. I'll let you pause. You can figure that one out. Uh, but let's move on to the second one, communion. That baptism one reference will make sense in a little bit when we read a passage. But uh, take a look at communion. We take the bread, we take the clop, the clop. What is wrong? We take the bread and we take the cup. And what we're doing in taking it is we are declaring that Jesus' work saved me, right? It's a personal, it's a corporate declaration that I was dead in my sin. We were dead in our sin. But because of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, we've been raised to a, a new way of life, all right? So you can't tell me that um, when the, you know, when the, when the church was, um, when the disciples were celebrating Passover, uh, you can't tell me that then after Jesus' resurrection, his death, his resurrection, that that communion took on like this different significance, right? So um, Acts chapter 2, verses 46 through 47, this is what it says there. Uh, for you. Acts chapter 2, 46 through 47. It says, and day by day, this is talking about the early church, all right? Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Right? So they would gather together in their homes. They would remember what Jesus has done for them. And it took on an absolutely different significance, not just because Jesus had lived, died, but because he had also resurrected, right? And then it goes on to say, and the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. So um, the good news is that Jesus didn't stay dead and it affected everything. Um, it was, it's the keystone to Christianity. It's essential to the gospel. It's essential to how we as the church remember and proclaim and declare the work of Jesus in the gospel. All right. So why is the resurrection important? Let me give you let me give you a third reason. The third reason is that the Holy Spirit uses the resurrection to give the church a new way of living. All right. So Romans chapter six, the verses one through four says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we and listen, listen to this, listen to the language. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Right. So picture death, picture burial. OK. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, right? So there's the going down, being, you know, dying to death, dying to sin. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried there, buried therefore with him by baptism into death 
In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, right? So that's the picture in baptism is you you die to your sin and you're raised to walk in a new way of life. That's why we call it baptism, not drowning. Because if if all if if the resurrection wasn't a part of of this whole thing, then we just be like, hey, you you die to death, all right, but then they drown, right? But baptism is we we bring them back up again because why? Because Jesus got out of the tomb, because we walk in newness of life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, after Easter, we're actually going to be preaching through the book of Acts. And what we're going to see is that God used the church to expand his kingdom incredibly. And so the church is sent out with this unbelievable news that we are all dead in our sins but Jesus, he rose. Jesus is alive. Death has been defeated. And so you don't need to stay in your sins either. You don't need to stay dead. Why? Because Jesus rose from the grave. So um, that's all amazing news. Now, here's those are all the reasons that that resurrection is vitally important to the Christian message. So if it's that important, if all of Christianity rests not on an ideology, not on a philosophy, but if all of Christianity rests on an historical event, on Jesus getting out of the grave, walking out of the tomb, if all of it rests on that one historical event, then it stands to reason that throughout history, there will have been many attempts to disprove the resurrection. Because if you disprove the resurrection, like Paul says, it's all done. It's a house of cards that comes crashing down. It's the keystone. Remove it. The arch no longer stands, right? So if you get rid of the resurrection, you get rid of all of Christianity. So it then must be that many people have tried to disprove the resurrection. And if you look historically, there have been many counter arguments. Uh, many objections uh, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I want to do just today, run through kind of the top four uh, counter arguments, the uh, objections to Jesus' resurrection, right? So the first one that I would mention, and um, again, I kind of took a bunch of these from, it was the problem of God, the reason for God, resurrection by Hank Henner. We kind of compiled a bunch of my resources, came up with the four most common counter arguments to the resurrection of Jesus. So let me give them to you here. The first one is a swoon theory. All right. This is a theory that Jesus did not die on the cross, that basically he just passed out and everyone assumed he was dead. And then God made it appear that Jesus was dead, but he never actually died and he was later revived. All right. Now, what this theory shows is actually just plain ignorance of the process of crucifixion. OK, um, many of you remember when the Passion of the Christ came out and you went to the theaters and then you were absolutely horrified and disgusted at the the reality, the real um, depiction of a crucifixion, how grotesque it really is. Right. So the swoon theory, I mean, it just it just shows ignorance of this process of crucifixion. Right. So first of all, criminals are. They were tortured. They were brutally flogged with whips that had like bone and shards of sharp things in them. Um, it was an actual, it's just brutal process. There was, in some cases, such an incredible amount of blood loss that, that many criminals actually died during the flogging. They didn't even make it to their crucifixion. Um, furthermore, you get, kind of get to the actual crucifixion, uh, nailing a person to a stake of wood. And um, those nails, I mean, the, the Romans, they had this, excuse the pun, but I mean, they had this process nailed down. I mean, they knew exactly where to drive the nails through, uh, you know, the, the nerve systems in a body. Um, and then the soldiers to kind of speed up the process, they would they would break the legs because then a person couldn't like lift themselves up and actually breathe. And so uh, people would die by if they made it that far, they would die by as asphyxiation. And then the soldiers, uh, they, they had to make sure that a person was dead. And so what they would do in the very end is they, they'd take a spear and they would thrust it upward in between the rib cage and through the heart sack of the person dying on the cross just to ensure that they were absolutely uh, dead. So to say that, you know, <laughs> this wound theory was was true is just pure ignorance of the process. Um, 
Jesus would have had to survive flogging. He would have had to survive the crucifixion. And then he would have had to survive 36 hours in a grave with no, no warmth, no food, no water, no medical care at all. And, and then somehow he would have had to have regained enough strength to like move the stone and then like MMA the, the Roman guards, right? And then... Um, and then he would have had to walk all over the place because people saw Jesus for 40 days after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, right? He appeared to hundreds of people, to over 500 people. And, um, you know, if you believe the swoon theory, then he would have had to have gone through the flogging, the crucifixion, the tomb. And then he, <laughs> he would have had to, have to walk around after his ankles had been pierced in the crucifixion. Like, guys, I don't... You ever had a man cold? I mean, right, we men, we get a cold and, and we're down and out. Never mind crucified, flogged, time in a tomb. So anyway, that's that's the swoon theory. And then there's also the um, there's the stolen body theory. So let me let me get after that one for a bit here. Um, the Jews, they they believed in the resurrection at the end of time, but they believed that that would only occur for the Jewish nation, for, for the righteous people. They did not believe what was what was peculiar to them about Jesus' resurrection, the claim to resurrection, is that, you know, God never promised in, in their world, God never promised that he would resurrect an individual in the middle of history. Okay, so um, what the what the chief priests do is they, they get together with the soldiers that were guarding Jesus' tomb and uh, they concoct a story and they say, well, Jesus was not resurrected. Rather, his body was stolen. And uh, you can find that account in Matthew 28 where they bribe the guards, they fabricate a story, and, and that's how the empty tomb came to be. Um, and here's what they say. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now, the problem with that is a number of things would have had to occur for that to be reality. First of all, all the guards would have had to fall asleep at the same time. Now, if if a prisoner ever escaped uh, a Roman guard, that Roman guard's life was on the line. All right. So that all of them would have fallen asleep at the same time. That That's just bizarre. And then to remain asleep while kind of the Roman seal on the tomb was was broken, while this incredibly heavy stone was rolled aside. And then they would have had to like carry Jesus' dead body um, past these sleeping guards. Now, I don't know if you've caught this, if you've ever read the, you know, the New Testament, the Gospels. Jesus' disciples were fishermen. They weren't ninjas. All right. So, I mean, even if the body... and So, okay, let's grant that they stole the body. Even if the body was stolen you still have to account for the fact that Jesus' body returned to vibrant life, that he still appeared to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in the next 40 days, and then all of a sudden that stops, right? So it still doesn't do away with the reality of there's a resurrected Jesus walking around. Um, and then you have the twin theory. Now, uh, probably a little bit too much Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito on this one, but uh, this is a theory that Jesus had an unknown identical twin that, um, that they came and they stole, the disciples stole Jesus' body from the tomb, and then this twin simply impersonated Jesus. And my question would be like, okay, why did no one know about Jesus' twin? All right. Um, here, here, here's kind of the bigger problem. Jesus' mother was present at Jesus' crucifixion, and uh, moms are observant. She would have noticed, right, if, if it would have been Jesus' twin, if Jesus had a twin. And then the other kind of bigger problems, too, are, I, I mean, what about Jesus' scars from the crucifixion, right? They were visible on Jesus' resurrected body, and they were, even in fact, they were inspected by the disciples within the 40 days after Jesus uh, rose from the grave. And then you still have the issue, well, the tomb is still empty, the burial cloths are left behind, all of that sort of thing. Uh, so that's the twin theory. And then you get to the hallucination theory. And this is where, this is where you know, uh, people look at Jesus' resurrection and the accounts in the Gospels and extra biblical um, uh, kind of stuff. And, and, and here's what they say. They say, well, the disciples, they, what they really did is they projected their own desires for Jesus' resurrection on reality. And that became to the, you know, a, a hallucination for them. And that uh, the stories of Jesus' resurrection, um, it was just wishful thinking by the disciples, and, and it was parable at best. Here's the problem with that. Hallucinations are private individual experiences. 
But what Paul does is he records Jesus appearing to 500 people, uh, to over 500 people. All right. So um, Jesus shows up after his his resurrection. He shows up in a variety of places and a variety of times to a variety of people and then abruptly ends after 40 days. It'd be kind of weird if if this was a hallucination that everyone was having. Right. And then it abruptly ended 40 days after it began. That That's odd. It just it just doesn't fit. Right. Now, those are kind of the top four and they're kind of the top four best ones. Apart from that, you would have to kind of go back further if you wanted to uh, object to the resurrection. And this is, in fact, what some people do. They say, well, Jesus was just never a historical figure. He just never actually lived. And that's just going like way out on a limb. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. He says, when we look at the objections to the resurrection of Jesus, it's really just a case of chronological snobbery. And, and here's what he means by that. Chronological snobbery is when, when we as modern people, we look at ourselves and we're like, we're so brilliant. We're so amazing. We're so superior to the ancients, to people who've lived before us, right? Um, we look at ourselves and we're like, oh, we got science. We got critical thinking. And what did they have? They had like myth. They were gullible. They had stories. Of course, they would be quick to believe in Jesus' resurrection. Of course, they would come up with this grand story of how he defeated death. But here's the problem. If you do your research, like, like actual legitimate historical research, what you're going to find is that in the area where, where Jesus did his ministry, um, in and around you know Jerusalem, Judea, um, the dominant worldviews were, were, came from the Greeks and from the Jews, right? From, and so a Greco-Roman worldview, um, they held to what was called Gnosticism. And so here's what they believed. Uh, the Greeks, the Romans, they believed that everything physical was evil. They looked around them, everything wasn't great. And so they said, well, the physical is evil, the, the material is evil, and the immaterial is good. The soul is good. And so to the Greco-Roman worldview, um, death was actually liberation. It was a liberation for what was inside, that what was pure, and that was uh, kind of imprisoned by what was impure, your physical. So um, that was a Greco-Roman worldview. So if you were to come to the Greeks and the Romans and you were to pitch this idea of, hey, there's a resurrection. There's a time when, you know, after you die, where your, your soul lives on, your body is in the ground, but there's going to be a resurrection where, where the two will come back together again, where God will miraculously resurrect your physical body and reunite it with your soul once again. The Greeks and the Romans are looking at you go like, that's not at all attractive because why would, why do we want to be back with that which is evil, right? So it wasn't a part of their worldview. They never would have expected a resurrection. It never would have been good news to them. And then you look at the Jewish worldview. <clears throat> the Jewish worldview, the material world was good. Death was a tragedy, right? Because death takes us out of God's creation. Someday in the future, though, what they, what they believed was that um, there would be a bodily resurrection of the righteous, of the people of their nation, and of God's creation. So God's people and God's creation. That's what the Jews believed. There would be a resurrection of, of, of all of that. But here was the problem with Jesus' resurrection uh, for, uh, for the Jewish worldview is that Jesus was resurrected in the midst of corrupt creation. He was resurrected in the middle of, of decay while sickness and death continued. And that to the Jew was a completely foreign concept. They weren't looking for that. They weren't wanting that. De um, resurrection and the hope for them was that at some point, God would resurrect it all at the same time, but not an individual. And for them, it was national. But here, here you have an individual who's claiming to be God, who's resurrected in the midst of corrupt and decay, cre decayed creation, right? So, um, so the argument that everyone was expecting this, that it, like, it just fit perfectly into some... Uh, uh, to, to a cultural narrative that was already there, that just couldn't be further from the truth. So first century people, they found Jesus' resurrection, you know what, quite frankly, maybe just as impossible as some, as some of you find it. So here's the thing, though. When faced with the evidence um, of Jesus' resurrection, their worldview was challenged and their beliefs were challenged. 
And I guess that would be my hope for, for some of you that, that your worldview, your beliefs will be challenged about Jesus' resurrection, about Easter, about why we celebrate so incredibly as the church, the, the risen Jesus, right? So you have to do something with the risen God. You have to do something with a man who overcame death and said he was God, all right? So that would be my hope. Uh, some of you would dig into the central claim of Christianity. It's the keystone of Christianity. It matters incredibly uh, to the Christian worldview that Jesus overcame death, that he's alive today. Listen, to wrestle with that, that may change everything for some of you. And so what we're gonna do in the next video is we'll, we'll take a look at the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, all right? So um, love you and we'll see you next time. High five.